Hello and welcome to this edition of BizTalk. I'm Guanxing in Beijing. Against the backdrop of rapidly changing global economic landscape, China's role and performance have garnered significant attention. As we stand on the cusp of a new year, the world eagerly seeks to understand the implications of China's economic performance in 2023 and the potential outlook for 2024. To shed light on this, I'm very glad to be joined by Professor Li Daokui, a renowned economist, to our show today. Professor Li is a leading Chinese economist in academic and policy research, and he will provide us with invaluable perspectives on China's economic trajectory, investment opportunities, and the evolving dynamics that are shaping the global economic order. Welcome to the show, Professor Li. Thank you very much for having me. So let's start with your assessment of China's economic performance in 2023. And looking ahead to 2024, what trajectory do you see? Well, I do see a below expectation performance in 2023 with very necessary and important policy adjustment throughout the year. And in 2024, I look forward to a much better uh, economic performance uh, with the impact of the policy adjustment. Mm -hmm. So what exactly disappointed you? Because if you look at the figures, Chinese economy is projected to grow by 5.2% uh, according to the World Bank and 5.4% uh, according to the IMF. And it has met its, expect its goals set out earlier this year. So what exactly disappointed you? Well, uh, sitting in the Chinese economy, I myself, together with my colleagues and my friends, we all feel that the economy uh, should be running faster uh, than 5.2 or 5.3 number uh, indicates. In other words, uh, the actual feeling of the economy is colder than the, than the numbers indicate. The fundamental reason is because consumers uh, and are very cautious in China. They are not uh, forthcoming in their uh, consumption, and also they are very cautious when it comes to uh, purchasing uh, properties. So the consumption and the properties are not running as fast as um, they should be. As a result, uh, uh, entrepreneurs and uh, business managers are not making uh, investment as fast as people expected at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And overall, overall, uh, 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 the, um, the economy is not running as fast as um, people uh, like myself uh, expected at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So you mean there is a growth potential underlying in the economy, but we ha still have not made full use of it? Absolutely. I think the growth potential of Chinese GDP should be something uh, around 5.8, 5.9, a mm. high five number, or even perhaps a low 6 6% uh, 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 growth rate. However, the Chinese economy is running 5.2 to 5.3 for 2023, mm. And let's remind ourselves that last year, 2022, was a very slow year for the Chinese economy. So based on the very slow year of 2022, the 23 number should be high, should mm. be, in my view, should be, we should experience 6% GDP growth in uh, as recovery. However, we are only running at the low fives. That's why we feel on the ground in the Chinese economy, we feel much colder than mm. the temperature and the thermometer indicates. Mm. Um, one thing came to my mind is expectation, because when you talk about entrepreneurs who are holding back their investment and consumers who are, are not willing to spend more, because uh, you are actually expecting some uh, lower, uh, six, uh, a little bit lower than 6% on the growth rate. Uh, do you think we should have higher expectations because that could lead to more investment uh, from the corporate side and also more consumption from consumers? Uh, absolutely. Okay, there are several things the government uh, uh, should do. And uh, to a large extent, the government is now uh, making decisions on and most likely will do next year. Uh, the first thing is to uh, find a way to subsidize consumption. Notice I call subsidized consumption, not subsidized income. Okay, these are different things, okay? In other words, give people a discount, mm -hmm. a paid out a government budget. Give people a discount when people are deciding uh, that they are consuming. So in other words, when you go to a cashier in a mm -hmm. department store, 
uh, somebody from the government uh, tells the cashier, oh, um, Miss Wang, you get um, a 10% discount uh, thanks to the government policy. Well, that way you are more willing to consume, especially if you know this beforehand. Mm. If you go before going to a department store, you are told that there is a 10% uh, discount given by the central government. You'll be happy to, you'll be more happy to consume. That's the first thing I think I, the government can do. Second thing is to stabilize the property market. Mm. Okay, to get rid of to get rid of the um, purchasing required restrictions uh, in cities like Beijing and Shanghai, which were imposed uh, uh, in 2012 when the property market was super hot. But today, the, the very few people in China are counting on the property market as a means of investment. So we needed to get rid of uh, housing uh, purchasing re uh, restrictions. That's the mm. second thing the government can do. The third thing the government can do, and I believe is already announced, is to pinpoint key sectors to um, to subsidize investment, in, in particular energy transition. Energy transition. China has announced 2023, uh, 2030, 20, uh, 2060 uh, carbon emission as, uh, targets. Mm. And in order to reach that, investments have to be done. And investments have to be done to uh, to replace uh, the coal-powered power plants by solar panels and by windmills, so on and so forth. And these requires investment. So these are these three areas: subsidized consumption, uh, stabilized housing market by eliminate, eliminating restrictions on housing purchasing, and uh, to subsidize investment in new energy. These three things. Once can be once they are done, I, I do believe the economy will run much faster. Mm. Well, the government has been talking about counter cyclical adjustment, but I have the feeling that the government is rather prudent in its either monetary policy or fiscal policy because China's fiscal budget is said to be uh, remain at around uh, just a three percent. Do you think there are room for more expansionary policies and how to prevent financial risks if the government? tries to do that. Yeah, you are absolutely accurate in describing that the, the Chinese government has been very cautious, I would say overly cautious when it comes to um, the physical budget, okay? Mm. And um, in fact, in fact, I, I, I believe our government, the Chinese government uh, should be uh, more proactive in other words, the government is overly cautious, excessively cautious. Why is that? Uh, let me say this in a very simple language. The Chinese central government is the, by far, the richest, richest mm -hmm. uh, central government in the world, having lots of financial assets. For example, the central government in China, through the Ministry of, of Finance, holds uh, majority shares uh, of significant shares of um, the five largest commercial banks, which are among the most profitable commercial banks in the world. Mm. And these commercial banks have shares listed in the stock market. And also our central government through the Ministry of Finance holds shares of the three super profitable mobile phone operators. And mm. also the central government holds shares of uh, Petro China, and um, and uh, uh, Sinopec, these oil companies, uh, and the Sino Construction, so on and so forth. The, the super, super profitable firms, most of them, most of them have uh, uh, their significant shares being held by the central government. Meanwhile, our central government, the Chinese central government, only holds uh, in the amount of 20% of GDP as central government debt. So mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as, a, as an outcome, as a Zero. result, I propose, I propose our central government spend much more money, mm. issue, uh, have, have issue more debt, issue much, much more debt. And also by issuing central government debt, the central government should take over uh, some of the local government debt in order to uh, uh, rejuvenize, rejuvenize the, the 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 public finance of local governments. So, mm. so, so my point is that the long answer boils down to one sentence: that is, our Chinese central government 
should be much more proactive when it comes to physical policy. And they are very solid, very good economic analysis. I'm, I'm, I'm gradually winning the battle. I'm proposing this to our central government. I think I'm <laughs> gradually winning the battle. Good to know, and uh, and hopefully China can uh, to adopt more proactive policies and to make full use of the potential of the economy. So the World Bank is expecting 4.5 percent for 2024. What is your target for the economy if China can do the right thing? Well, I would say most realistically, the Chinese economy will be running at the pace of 5 percent next year. 2024, 5 percent, I repeat. Now, why is that? Uh, well, be, I think it's because um, the Central Economic Work Conference, which was held uh, December 11 to December 12th uh, this year, this, this month, actually laid the ground for a uh, very, uh, very uh, 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 proactive policies in various areas, various forms in a property market, the physical policy, monetary policy, industrial policy, uh, so on and so forth. So that next year, especially the second half of next year, will be a year of much, much faster uh, economic growth than this year. So 5% is the number I, I count up, I, will, I forecast for 2024. Mm. And that gave us much needed confidence at this stage. And Professor Lee, let's talk a bit about global environment, which is uh, full of challenges this year. Uh, in context of global supply chain dynamics, how is China adapting its manufacturing and trade strategies to navigate disruptions? Well, China has been adopting a two-fold policies, two-fold, two-hands policies. The first aspect of this policy is to try to work with the U.S. and the European uh, governments to mm. stabilize, to stabilize uh, the, the the potential economic uh, conflict. Uh, in other words, try to maintain the already uh, mature and ongoing uh, supply chain uh, between China and Europe and the U.S. So China has made uh, a lot of efforts, and China will continue making such efforts uh, in years to come. The second aspect of China's trade policy is to try to um, uh, re, re, uh, redeploy, re encourage the re, the encourage the redeployment of China's supply chain to other countries and um, to, um, to to um, to hedge to hedge against the uh, U.S. European. Uh, policies. More, more specifically, uh, China's industries are being uh, gradually moving to uh, Vietnam and to Mexico and also other Southeast Asian countries. And mm -hmm. notice, not all, not all production lines are out are moving out of China. It's only part of that. Part of Chinese supply chain is now being re redeployed. Redeployed to uh, Mexico and to Vietnam as a way to side pass, to side pass, to, to, to hedge against the U.S. Uh, uh, trade uh, restrictions against mm -hmm. Chinese product. It's, again, it's part of that. So move part of production to these countries, Mexico and Vietnam, so that the, the, the products finally can be shipped to the U.S. market uh, without being labeled as being made in China. Mm. Do you think how well is China adapting? Uh, because you know that those uh, investment overseas are not calculated in the GDP. So how will this trend affect China's economic development uh, in the uh, year to come? Well, it will uh, have, um, yes, it will, it will have a negative impact on uh, China's uh, GDP growth because part of the economic activities uh, which was fully, fully uh, inside China is moved to Vietnam, is moved to uh, Mexico. Mm -hmm. But notice part of that, not all, not all. So, um, so it, 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 it will have a negative impact for the Chinese economy. Uh, however, let's keep in mind that the Chinese economy is already much, much bigger. It's uh, something about 18 to 19 trillion US dollar, so that uh, export, uh, export is much smaller share 
mm -hmm. is of a much smaller share of the Chinese economy today than uh, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, export uh, accounts for roughly, roughly 15% of Chinese uh, GDP. And uh, 20 years ago, or maybe 12, uh, 12, 15 years ago, this number was uh, 30%. So, so yes, it will have negative impact. However, it's not going to be very, very large. Mm. And notice China is also upgrading, upgrading its production, uh, its production technology. So uh, right. uh, a lot of uh, exports to the rest of the world uh, will replace uh, the production capacity now moved to Mexico and Vietnam. Right. Well, as China's economy grows bigger, last year we have seen a lot of uh, significant events like the enlargement of the BRICS and the Belt and Road uh, Forum. And uh, we're seeing Chinese yuan is also playing a bigger role um, in global trade. Uh, how do you anticipate China's economic policies and international trade relations to adapt and shape the global economic order? in the year beyond? Well, in, com in the coming years, uh, starting from 2023, China will continue to be a progressive force uh, in uh, stabilizing global trade and a step also progressive force in encouraging other countries to open up. Because China, um, from its own experience of past 45 years of reform and opening up, uh, China knows very well that through mm -hmm. opening up, uh, the whole the whole world will benefit. Not mm -hmm. only the Chinese economy, the, the rest of the uh, the world will also benefit. So China China is good like a good student now. It's turning to become a good teacher, telling everybody, let's stay open economically. Everyone mm -hmm. will be uh, will be a, a, a beneficiary. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a one line of uh, a one one reason for China being um, being progressive in opening mm. up. The other reason why China has been um, uh, being very progressive, uh, being very uh, proactive in pushing for uh, more open global economy is because China, after forty five years of reform, is now uh, very confident. Uh, China, the Chinese economy is confident in, in that the Chinese economy will not, will not lose in international competition. Some sectors for sure will move out, out of the Chinese economy. However, moving out, these sectors moving out leaves room for other sectors to emerge. So overall, overall China, Chinese economy and the Chinese policymakers overall uh, are rather confident, confident, mm. uh, believing in that opening up uh, of international trade will e essentially and, e and, e and eventually benefit the Chinese economy itself. Mm. Actually, a figure shows that the trade restrictions in past three years have tripled according to the WTO. Because I know all economists are against the trade barriers. What is your take on this trend and what can China do? Well, the trend of uh, the trend towards more trade restrictions may continue in the world. Uh, however, I think there's a big good chance uh, that through regional agreements, regional agreements like China with Europe, China with ASEAN countries, China with um, with uh, BRIC, BRICS uh, countries and with um, the Belt and Road countries, through all this, uh, I call uh, the spaghetti, spaghetti type mm -hmm. of negotiations, right? Uh, mm -hmm. China will become a force to stop the intensive, the intensifying process of um, uh, international trade restrictions. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned earlier, China is moving up the value chain. As China continues to prioritize technological innovation, uh, what are the key areas uh, do you see the most potential for growth and investment? Well, uh, to, in my mind, uh, there are two areas for China to, um, to, to pin hope on uh, for technological progress. Number one is energy, which is not super obvious, but, 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 but it is key. It is key. Mm -hmm. The whole world is uh, in a process of energy transition. The whole world, not China, not only China. That is, the whole world is now moving towards green energy. 
And uh, green, by green energy, I mean uh, solar panels and uh, windmills. And the key to the transition from dirty energy to green energy or black energy to green energy is uh, storage, energy storage, yes. the storing of this, uh, this uh, intermittent uh, uh, energy, right? And mm -hmm. the China is now uh, at the at, at front, international front, frontier. It's a, it's a frontier country in designing, in, 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 in implementing uh, these technologies, the, the green technology and their storage. So this is one area China will make a, a head start. The other area is um, what we call AI and application of AI and also communications technology. And this, uh, there are many, many examples uh, in, in this regard. Uh, with, with AI, um, the delivery job of uh, our express packages uh, will, be, um, will, will be changed. Today in China, you see many, many uh, young people busy uh, riding their electrical bikes, delivering mm delivering uh, packages. In five years, I believe that uh, many of the electrical bikes will be replaced by um, auto, auto tricycles, tricycles, electrical tricycles with three wheels uh, without any human pilot. And these tricycles will deliver packages to our buildings, to our uh, to stores, right? So that will be a huge labor saving uh, uh, technology. How, you may ask, what will happen to the uh, to our express men, the, the young people who who do express work? Okay, they mm. will they will find new jobs in other areas. I, I mean, they are plentiful. I think the our human society usually are very good in finding ways to employ people. So I I'm not uh, pessimistic. I believe uh, there will be new jobs created uh, for this express uh, for these uh, young people, right? delivering packages. So that's the second area of technological progress, AI and uh, and the communication technology and the auto driving, so on and so forth. Hmm, right. China has a massive market and there is always a possibility uh, to make a fortune. And uh, last year, uh, emerging markets are facing some significant pressure of capital outflow and that um, includes China. Uh, in your opinion, what is the uh, risk and reward profile for foreign investors who try to engage with China market this year? Well, um, uh, it is increasingly clear that the Chinese market proper or itself is already huge enough for international investors to stay in China. So in other words, they often call it a strategy called in China for China. Mm. Uh, the, the leading example, of course, is automobile, the automobile market, right? All the major automobile makers uh, cannot afford to, to leave the uh, Chinese market. So they will stay in the Chinese market. They will find a way to increase their R&D, research and development activities, and tapping uh, tapping the, the, the huge pool of uh, engineering talents in China. So, that, so that's the area of uh, opportunity for multinationals. Stay in China, uh, tap on, uh, tapping the, 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 the engineering and an R&D capacity, and then use China as, um, as, a, uh, as a basis for their global research and also for their uh, enhancing their technology. So that's the new that's new opportunities for multinationals. Mm -hmm. And we heard a lot about uh, the risking in the past year. How is China's evolving relationship with other major economies such as the U.S. and the European Union influencing the investment outlook for um, multinational corporations and foreign investors? Well, China has been uh, working hard, especially for the past two months. Uh, Chinese leaders have have, have been very work have been very busy. Uh, talking to uh, U.S. and European leaders, uh, trying to um, to create initially uh, an agreement and later on some concrete policies to stabilize to stabilize uh, uh, their concerns uh, of of China being a risk factor. Okay, mm -hmm. and also China will open up its own domestic market uh, further. Uh, for multinational companies, especially those from the U.S. and from Europe. 
Chinese automobile market, Chinese um, uh, power plant, uh, power plant, Chinese uh, factories, Chinese uh, uh, home appliance, so on and so forth. All these sectors will be increasingly open, and in many cases will be completely open to uh, multinationals. And in the past decades, uh, uh, to be frank, a Chinese government uh, was worried about multinationals being super competitive so that domestic firms will completely, completely lose out. Uh, but now, as I said, Chinese leaders and Chinese economy are becoming more confident. So the, the, the door of the Chinese economy will be more open and most sectors will be completely open in five years. Mm. In five years, most sectors, I mean, I mean, except for the, those defense sectors, will be completely open. Uh, there's no need for uh, protection for mm. domestic uh, domestic firms. Mm. We're talking about opening more uh, and creating more opportunities for foreign investors. Let's talk about the uh, financial industry. And in the context of China's commitment to financial market reforms and opening up its capital markets, what are the implications for global investors and asset managers seeking to allocate capital within China? Well, well, Chinese uh, uh, the stock market has not been doing very well for the past two years, to be frank, including 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, however, I do believe that uh, 2024 will be most likely uh, a transition year or a year of reversal, a year of reversal uh, for our stock markets. Uh, why is that? Because, because for the past two years, Chinese stock market was not doing well, mainly because people in China and also all over the world are worried about the Chinese economy. The economy indeed did not uh, perform as uh, as well as expected, as I have mentioned at the beginning of our of our you know conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. But next year, next year, as I already indicated, next twenty twenty four, the Chinese economy will see a major turn up turnaround, especially mm -hmm. the second half. Okay, people, I think, especially investors, will feel better, will feel better with a lot of. Um, uh, pragmatic policies being implemented and um, uh, economic growth uh, will pick up. So by the second half, the latest of next year, Chinese uh, stock markets will gradually improve most likely. So this to me uh, represents an important opportunity for uh, asset uh, allocators uh, outside China. So pay attention to Chinese A Asia markets next year. Mm -hmm. Well, if we look at the economic numbers, we do see a pickup in the fourth quarter uh, compared to the third quarter. So looking ahead to 2024, what indicators are you closely watching uh, to gauge the direction of Chinese economy and what risk are you looking out for? Well, I, I would watch very carefully, number one, the consumption figure. Number two, uh, the CPI. I do expect CPI to have... Um, a turnaround to have a moderately uh, to, to 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 turn into a moderately uh, a high number like two or three percent, and also look carefully, very very carefully, the the number of the sales of property, and I do expect the sales of property will stabilize by the middle of next year. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, policies to get rid of restrictions of purchasing of housing. Uh, will be in place. At least I have confidence in this. Mm -hmm. And also, I look for number. I look very carefully numbers of investment, especially investment by uh, private enterprises. So, if all these, if most of these numbers um, um, uh, move in the right direction, especially property sales, then uh, the overall outlook of the Chinese economy 2024 will be much much better than this year. And what's the risk? You mentioned what's the risk. The risk is still with the property market. Mm. Okay, so uh, if the property market continues to be uh, slowing down, the prices in many cities are still going down, and the sales still uh, uh, still uh, decreasing, then then many consumers don't feel well. Many mm. investors don't feel well, and uh, steel makers, cement makers, construction material makers, uh, just. 
so so on so forth will all feel very miserable okay the furniture uh, furniture the um, textile you, you, you name it most sectors will be affected but I, I I do believe that this risk uh is it should be under control the the key is uh, is to get rid of the restrictions of housing purchase by uh people in living in Beijing in Shanghai in Guangzhou so on and so forth and they that you said earlier decisive action is needed right now uh, to reverse um, that expectations and thank you so much for your time today professor Lee we appreciate your insights that's all for today's biz talk thank you for joining us until next time bye for now